Welcome to today's community lecture. I'm your host, Dr. Nav Badesha. I'm a UCLA trained geriatrician, and today we'll be discussing the specific evidence-based protocol to reverse frailty and decrease fall risk through diet and strength training. By the end of today's lecture, you'll be able to define frailty and understand its risks. You'll learn specific dietary recommendations and eating patterns and we'll also be going through a step-by-step -step exercise protocol that has shown evidence in reversing frailty. This lecture is based around a recent randomized control trial, which will be referenced frequently. Let's begin with a real case. In this animation, I want to introduce you to Phyllis. She is a 78-year-old community-dwelling female who is ambulatory without an assisted device at baseline. Today, she's doing well. She lives in Los Angeles in a single story home and has a son and two grandchildren who live nearby. Her primary care doctor sees her about twice a year and helps her manage her diabetes and heart failure. As Phyllis ages, her son and family are unable to see her as often. She occasionally forgets to take her medications and has decreased her mobility since she stopped playing with her grandchildren. She then has a fall and becomes frailer, eventually becoming mostly non-ambulatory. By the time she's 84 years old, she's going in and out of the hospital. Her primary care doctor does notice this decline in function and tries to schedule more frequent visits. Nonetheless, she develops a UTI and eventually a pneumonia and goes back into the hospital for one last time. Poor Phyllis has met her poor ending. No one is really happy with this outcome for Phyllis. Her son is upset and doesn't really understand how things decline so rapidly. Could there have been a primary care intervention that may have reduced or potentially reversed her frailty? Or at least to have improved her quality of life in these later stages. Enter today's community lecture to reverse frailty and decrease fall risk through diet and strength training. Let's start with a brief background on the concept of frailty. In the absence of a gold standard, frailty has been operationally defined by Freed et al. as meeting three out of these five phenotypic criteria. Reduced muscle strength or low grip strength, low energy expenditure, slowed walking speed, exhaustion with even small amounts of physical activity, and or unintentional weight loss. An older adult that has three or more of these theoretically is at increased risk of disability, dependency, and mortality from aging-associated decline. People with one or two of these can be scored as pre-frail. This is based on the analysis indicating that this group was different in terms of risk of disability and death compared to both frail and robust groups. It's estimated that at least 20% of older adults are frail and over a quarter of those over the age of 85 years old meet this criteria. Mortality risk is almost three times higher for frail people when compared with their non-frail counterparts. At the opposing end of this biological health spectrum lies resilience, which is the capacity to withstand stressors. An important concept to understand is homeostenosis. We all have some form of physiologic reserve. When we're younger, our physiologic reserve is larger, allowing the body to have more reserves to take on an external stressor like an infection or an injury. And as we get older, the physiologic reserve becomes narrow. For example, if you have an illness here, you have all this reserve to be able to fight it. When you're older, and if you have an illness here, you only have this much reserve and therefore, Older people have an increased risk of negative outcomes. Question number two, true or false? It is possible to put on muscle mass after the age of 80. The answer is true. Here's an excellent reminder of the power of exercise in preserving muscle mass as we age. What we're seeing here are axial MRI views of the thighs. 
Imagine cutting into the thigh in half and looking at it in a cross section. At the top, we have a 74 year old gentleman who spends most of his time sitting or laying in bed. And at the bottom, we have the image of a 70 year old who is a triathlete. He still runs, he still lifts weights, and he still stretches. Notice how much more muscle tissue the 70 year old active gentleman has when compared to the 74 year old who is not very active. There is a way to find out if your legs are weak or if you have fall risk. We'll start with two ways your doctor might check to see if you're at higher risk for falls. It is not recommended to perform these or the exercises we'll be reviewing until you've been evaluated by your primary care doctor. And it is safest to perform these under direct supervision to prevent injury. First is tandem testing, which is both a test to evaluate fall risk as well as a balance exercise technique. It involves three stances, starting with holding a side-by-side -side stance with the feet close together for 10 seconds. Inability to perform this makes one more likely to be high fall risk. If it can be performed safely, then it progresses to the moderately difficult semi-tandem where one foot is arranged slightly behind the other for 10 seconds. This should be done on both sides. Inability to perform this without help makes one more likely to be a moderate fall risk. If it can be performed safely, then it progresses to the last and most difficult full tandem stance. The ability to perform this for 10 seconds makes one more likely to be a lower fall risk. Second way to evaluate this is, do you use your hands to stand up? And could you stand up without using your hands? If you do use your hands to stand up and you would find it difficult to stand without using them, it is likely that you do have leg weakness and possibly fall risk. A recent study showed that it is possible for frail adults to put on muscle mass as quickly as three months. Next, we will discuss this study and the specific exercises and nutrition recommendations that were used. The intervention group received a three-month home-based exercise program focused on strength training along with dietary protein guidance targeting 1.2 grams per kilogram per day. The effectiveness of the intervention was assessed using the SHARE frailty instrument this tool measures frailty using one objective measure, which is grip strength, measured using a constant dynamometer, and asks for self-reported questions regarding fatigue, loss of appetite, functional difficulties, and physical activity. I've listed the questions that are asked regarding these four here in this slide. Face-to-face -face patient training by the primary care physician took no more than five minutes. They provided them with written information along with pictures on exercises and protein consumption. Participants were encouraged to do 10 separate strength training exercises. It was recommended they spend at least 20 minutes per day performing these exercises for at least four times per week. And in addition to this, it was recommended they walk for 30 to 45 minutes, three to four times per week. Here are picture images of the exercises that were recommended. Bear in mind, it was recommended patients do anywhere from 10 to 15 reps of each of these exercises, only one set at a time. It was recommended they take a 30 second break between the exercises and that they choose a weight that they were comfortable with. They also mentioned don't do any exercises that increase pain. Number one was a bicep curl. Sit down and hold on to a dumbbell. 
Bend your elbow while holding the dumbbell. At the top of the movement, slowly lower the dumbbell in a controlled way. Keep your elbow tucked into your side. This is a strengthening exercise for your elbow and upper arm, biceps muscle. And number two is a shoulder press. Grasp a light dumbbell in each hand and gently lift the dumbbell above your head with one arm and then the other. Only go as far as feels comfortable. This exercise strengthens the deltoid muscle group. Three was a front shoulder raise. Gently lift your arm to your front while holding a light dumbbell. Ask your therapist how far you should lift the weight. When you reach the limit, which is usually at 90 degrees, lower the dumbbell. This exercise predominantly strengthens the anterior deltoid. Four was tricep curl. Hold a dumbbell and straighten your arm above your head. When you reach the top of the movement, slowly let the dumbbell drop down behind your back. This exercise predominantly strengthens the tricep muscle at the back and side of your upper arm. Five was the sit to stand. Sit upright with good posture and place your hands on the side of the chair. Gently lean forwards and use as much leg strength as you can to push yourself up. Use your hands and arms to assist. Sit upright with good posture. Place your arms across your chest. Gently lean forwards and use as much leg and core strength as you can to push yourself up. If you get stuck, use one or both arms to assist. Once upright, stand up straight. When you feel comfortable, slowly sit back down, ideally with your arms across your chest. However, if you need some guidance, then use your arms to assist the sitting. Try to keep a straight spine during the sitting rather than let your back round forwards too much. This exercise will strengthen your legs and core. Six was leg extensions. Sit upright with good posture. Slowly straighten your left leg out in front of you as far as feels comfortable. Slowly lower back to the floor, then repeat with the right leg. If you suffer any cramp in your upper thigh, do not straighten your leg fully and keep a small bend. This exercise will help mobilize your knee and improve strength in your leg. Seven was hamstring curls. Stand upright with good posture, next to a wall or table, just in case you need support. Gently bring your heel towards your buttock of one leg, and then go back to your start position, and then repeat with the other leg. Heel kicks can act as a good hamstring strengthening exercise. Eight was rear leg raises. Stand with your hands on a wall, table or chair and extend your leg behind you and return to neutral. You should feel a pull in your buttock gluteal muscles. Nine was knee lifts. Stand upright with good posture. Hold on to a wall or table for support. Put your weight through one leg and bend the other knee towards your chest. This exercise will mobilize your hip joint and strengthen the hip flexor muscles. And 10 was calf raises. Stand on a step. Hold onto a handrail for balance if required. Slowly raise up onto your toes and control the movement back down just below the level of the step. This exercise will strengthen the calf muscles and ankle joints. Here's an image of the nutritional guidance patients received. It recommended they aim to eat 20 grams of protein within one hour of exercising and also encouraged them to calculate their daily protein target based around 1.2 grams of protein per one kilogram of body weight. For example, someone who weighs 70 kilograms would have to eat 84 grams of protein. On the left, you have animal protein. And on the right, you have plant-based protein. Recommendations? 
moving into the results. The risk of being frail at three months was significantly reduced in the intervention group relative to the control group. The number of frail participants in the intervention group decreased by two-thirds. Grip strength improved in the intervention group compared to the control group. At three-month follow-up, grip strength had increased in both women and men in the intervention group, while it was slightly decreased in women and men in the control group. Muscle mass, body fat, and biological age improved in the intervention group compared to the control group, though they were not statistically significant. The exercise program is very similar to the American College of Sports Medicine and CDC's recommendations when it comes to muscle strength training and aerobic exercise in older adults. As a matter of fact, the exercise program in the study actually recommends twice as much strength training of all the major muscle groups compared to the ACSM and CDC recommendations. In my opinion, this could strengthen the likelihood that an exercise program like this would be beneficial. In conclusion, I hope that today's lecture can serve as an important reminder that it's never too late to start exercising and improving. It is 100% possible to improve your mind-body connection no matter your age. Incorporating healthy habits in our routine can seem like a daunting task at times, but even starting with one small change can shift momentum in the right direction. My hope is that patients like Phyllis would have an improved quality of life in the final chapter of life with these type of non-pharmacologic interventions. With that said, I want to use the remainder of our time today to answer your questions, hear your comments and concerns, as well as welcome each of you to share your story and tell me a little bit about yourselves.